wanted to give you a chance to get reassembled. All right, uh, calling to order the Cape Canaveral Business and Economic Development Board uh, on January 11th at 6.03 p.m. Will the um, staff hold the roll? Shauna Taylor. Tom Hermanson. Here. Ron Felino. Chelsea Partridge. Here. Jane Seda. Stuart Smith. Here. Don Mays. Here. Great. Um, first order of business, uh, we have um, our um, minutes to approve from the previous meeting. So motion to approve that meeting. Minutes from the previous meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes. Minutes are approved. I'll sign those in a minute. Um, and I'm trying to pull up my agenda because my uh, computer is not behaving. Do we have them up on the screen? We didn't really have one beyond, beyond, right. So at the last meeting, we had discussed reviewing the economic development action plan, and the board felt that since we had four members present, um, that we did not have uh, enough of a majority here to review the plan fully. Uh, we wanted to make sure everybody had the opportunity to speak. We are in the same boat again. So I want to discuss to the committee as a whole, do we want to move on forward but we and perhaps begin the conversation and continue it in our next meeting? Uh, there's the option of potentially postponing the conversation and creating another meeting because um, we had set to have quarterly meetings. I have concern about pushing it that far out. Um, but I open up it for discussion, and I would love to hear what the thoughts of the rest of the uh, members of the committee is. I'm of the opinion we discuss tonight and move forward on this. I agree. What do you think? Yeah, I think if our goal is that we have common understanding so we can make decisions effectively as a board and we expect board members to be able to read it, then right, we're gonna be in the same dilemma next time with somebody not be able to attend. Yeah, it was just, I was trying to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to speak on it. Um, but if you guys are comfortable moving forward, then uh, I'm okay as soon as I can get my, there it is, um, notes to open up. So the main thing we talked about, so we'll go ahead and talk about the economic um, development action plan. And one of the things we talked about in the last meeting was for everybody to take some time and review it and come to the meeting with what you thought were your top three or four items to discuss about it, meaning whether or not you thought it was relevant. If you look at staff notes, they talked about the... Um, elements in it that were implemented and discussed. So I will start the conversation uh, by starting with Stu. If you want to talk about your top four items that you felt were things we need to talk about within the economic plan. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm going to do this as, as articulately <coughs> as I, I, I need to, right? So, so you can do it. Yeah. So I think number one is just a clear environmental assessment of what's going on because these, these things get dated fairly quickly, right? As soon as it's written down, it's it's obsolete. And so um, it may not be specifically written down that way, but uh, and we talked about the impact of the, um, the aquarium. Um, obviously the port is growing rapidly. So just having a clear understanding of what's going on that's impacting and influencing the way the city behaves and the coordination between us and we talked about Cocoa Beach as cities and how do we collaborate with that. I think that's, for me, number one, is just having a 
you can't do any planning unless you know where you're at, right? So um, that is number one for me. I didn't have any other specifics that were in here that I had enough concern about to elevate to a level of conversation. It's pretty straightforward stuff from my point of view. Okay. Um, so understanding of the plan as it exists today and then understanding of our current um, economic and situational um, awareness so that we can make effective decisions. Okay. Tom, do you want to go next? <clears throat> Would love to. Uh, I read the plan a couple times, uh, more recently today, and <clears throat> you know, still um, filled with a lot of good advice. Uh, I was hoping, uh, wasn't sure what format we were going to take, but I was hoping to have a discussion with Todd and David about kind of going through it. There were action steps, obviously, uh, or strategies and action steps and to talking through over the last 13 years, uh, which of those had been accomplished and, and which hadn't. Uh, and then uh, as those things come up, kind of uh, discuss some of them that I think are the more relevant ones for accomplishing, you know, the summary strategy of economic development. Uh, I can kind of, I've numbered these through, so I can just kind of quickly go through my, my questions. Uh, one of the ones I was curious about, and Melbourne, the city of Melbourne actually did a really good job probably six or seven years ago, putting together a, you know, it was like a 10 or 15 page slide deck where they enumerated all of their opportunity sites that the city would like to see. They were all privately owned, maybe one or two in there were publicly owned, but all privately owned that were, you know, underutilized, severely underutilized based on the infrastructure on there or vacant properties. And they put that together in a deck and then literally sent it out to everybody, including uh, site consultants, which are also uh, referenced here in, in the report. So do we have anything like that? Is that a question? That's a question. Okay. Have we put together an inventory of the opportunities for economic development? Yeah, I would say the quick answer is no. I mean, not, not put on paper and not, um, I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. It's kind of a, oh, I don't want to call it a spec sheet. Yeah. It's a, a database of, of properties and maybe some information, some basic information about zoning, utilities, um, access, transmit, trips, automobile trips, uh, all that kind of information. So I think collectively as a staff, we probably have a really good idea of what those opportunity sites are. Because there aren't that many. Right, exactly. And, and so they're in our heads, but as far as actually Yeah, I don't think it takes much, but it, it struck me as, oh, that'd be cool if the city had it. But then it really kind of struck home when in the section about, you know, you know one of the strategies is consulting with site selection people. Uh, and, you know, this is what the EDC does for the county with respect to manufacturing capacity and everything else uh, of existing buildings. But they don't necessarily, and they do do site selection stuff as well. Yeah, we, we used to get, as I recall, we used to get emails from... Yep. Saying, hey, we've got a we've got a client. This is what yeah. we're looking for, ABC. Yeah. Do you have anything that matches that that, that, that criteria? Yeah, I'm um, on that list. I haven't seen one of those. I know about Utah, but I haven't seen one of those for a long time. Yeah, no, I get them when they come out. Oh, you still you still get no, them? No, 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 and not recent, but okay. I'm on the list. Yeah, yeah, but it would be nice to. It would be no. nice to have a portfolio, if you will. All right, that was my first one. Second one is, is there a mechanism within the city code for impact fee deferrals as recommended under action three, step five? Is there, does no, that exist? There is no, um, nothing that does that. But impact fees have gone back and forth over the decades mm -hmm. from requiring them up front to requiring them at the end to requiring them up front and then COVID hit, put them at the end, COVID's over, put them back at the front again. 
it's, it's been this ping pong ball. And the most recent one was after COVID where council said, we wanna collect these up front. Um, deferrals, the whole idea, I think that's why it was originally done to the end. Yeah. It was to attract economic development. But our council got very concerned about that and wanted to put back at the front. Do you remember the reason for that, Dave? I, as I recall, it really related to COVID and upfront costs and how it would affect developers and, and getting projects COVID. going. Prior to COVID, when it was up front. Oh, I, I, I don't, I, no. I don't. No, we went through that on our on our last projects. If you recall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ho yeah. But only on the transportation one. Right. 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 All right. So yeah. That I think there may be, just in addition, quick note, I think there may be some bond issues with waiving or deferring, um, in particular, uh, our sewer impact fees. I think there might be some bonding considerations there. But as far as the other ones go, um, yeah, certainly we could look at that. Yeah, no, I, I was just curious if there was a mechanism, because I didn't know about it, if, if there was one. But not, Currently, not formal. Uh, so action seven under strategy two is a facade improvement program. Is there one in place for the CRA? Yes, sir. Yeah, so. Currently. Okay. Uh, the brownfield area. Can I ask I, a question on that? Is I'm it sorry. being utilized? Kyle? Yeah, so um, September 1st was when the program started and we we're inundated with applications. Okay, we, so yes, it, it's I, very popular. Because sometimes there's programs and nobody's using right. them. Right, we so. did a, a good job, I think, okay. making everyone aware. We did a mail out of all the property owners, as I recall, in the CRA, um, to noticing the, the, the project, uh, the, the opportunity, the grant. I will say this, though, that it was inordinately skewed towards the residential um, property owners. We didn't really have a whole lot of commercial folks is it intended for residential? Is that permitted in the, the way it's written? Mm -hmm. Yes. Both both commercial or residential. Mm -hmm. if, mm. if, if I could give just the, the 60 second tour of this. For years, the CRA program did not offer any grants. It was started uh, about two years ago by the city council and it was started um, specifically for signage and encouraging people to upgrade, update their commercial signage. And we put $50,000 into it as the available kitty of funds. And we had we did we got some luck with that and had a few signs three or four yeah not many and then the CRA board met again after the end of that year was up and they said well how did we do and they thought well we didn't do as much as we wanted to do we didn't even spend all that money so they said all right well let's open up categories and they said we want to open up storefronts facades signs um, paint for residential landscaping, landscaping site improvements those kind of things. Um, a bunch of things both commercial and residential. And that's what Kyle's referring to when it's been very popular, but the popularity has been among the residential crowd, not the commercial crowd. But it's still only $50,000. If it were more popular, I'm sure the CRA board would raise that up. Okay. Uh, I remember around the time the CRA was developed, the city went through a brownfield designation process. And I just haven't reviewed it since. It's gotta be 15 years ago. We did, um, the, the, the entire city at that time was considered brownfield eligible, but since then, state legislature has changed the definition and they said that you have to actually prove contamination before you actually get the designation of brownfield. We only have uh, one known site uh, where there's dissolved hydrocarbon plumes and that's um, where coastal fuels is. That's been monitored for about 30 years for those plumes and if there's others, they're unknown at this They're point. still monitoring on our property, Mason up at the north end, based on some Dow chemical spill 70 years ago. How many years? Uh, it was probably in the 50s. Okay. So the Port Authority currently pays for, and Tom Daly of Daly Engineering, until he just retired, was doing the ongoing monitor, and we have monitoring wells on that Mason property site. So that would be upon proof, it's the middle of proof, that would be eligible for brownfields. So our hands are tied anymore. We, it required, the state requires the property owner to prove that they have contamination and then they're eligible for brownfield designation and the benefits of that. Hmm. As, as far as I know, there's been no property owner to take advantage of the uh, brownfield um, yeah. tax exemption, you know, the, sale, the, the tax advantages and... That's and, correct. Yeah, so it's, it's been a very, it's been, well, it's just not been utilized in the city. Okay. 
Uh, going down my list here. Um, well, you saw that number 13 is a repeat of number 11. That's clerical in the report, but you're going to re the report's going to get rewritten. Uh, action 14 is kind of a repeat of the knowing what you have to develop. And uh, so 15, you guys are discussing now at the city commission meeting, uh, develop mixed use parking restaurant festival venue. And it sort of emphasizes allowing mixed use on smaller parcels. I know that's kind of uh, topic du jour here based on the ordinance that's going through. But since I'm up, si up sitting here in the comfortable leather seats, <laughs> I would put forth that if you're looking for economic development, you know, I'm going to rehash flexible codes, relief valve for things that you haven't considered, and possibly allowing mixed uses on smaller parcels as recommended by the plan. Uh, in action step 15, it references city owned parcels and uh, I probably spent a better part of four years flogging, uh, you know, a great development with a lot of other people for Lori Wilson Park that didn't come into fruition because the city wouldn't take it over and the county wouldn't fund anything. And so we ended up spending two and a half million dollars of TDC funds and what we got was the new boardwalk, some nicer trails and new bathrooms. Uh, which was outrageously expensive for what we got, but that's what it cost. Uh, <clears throat> I've always thought that Cherry Down Park uh, is a great opportunity for not to change it from a park, but to add additional amenities and services, not unlike you know all the great work the city did at the Cultural Center. And by that, in my mind, it is you know services that are that are uh, complementary to a beach park. Uh, it could be as much as sand volleyball courts, which is really low impact and uh, very easy to install. We couldn't even get that done in Laurie Park, Laurie Wilson Park, but I'm still working on that. Uh, and then I saw on Google Earth, actually, that there's a surfboard renter that works, surfboard concessionaire that works off the boardwalk, um, but other sort of smaller infrastructure, better bathrooms, and, and uh, I hate to use the word commercial facilities, ability for concessionaires to work out of a, a nice place. You know, imagine a small ice cream shop, t-shirt, boogie board sales, uh, surfboard rentals, something of that nature. Even, even pushing the envelope as far as some kind of a venue where you might be able to get some sodas and some, you know, sandwiches at the park. Just an idea. Uh, but utilization, uh, you know, because our founding fathers in so many of these municipalities throughout the county limited oceanfront and riverfront access to residential, we now have, you know, probably 300 feet, 300 miles or more of coastline. If you consider the ocean, the Banana River, Merritt Island, and on both sides, and the mainland. And I think last time I counted, there was maybe like 20 venues and 300 miles of waterfront, which is a crime. You know, we all move here to be on the water, see the water, but we limited it to residential development. And so the only opportunities here in the city of Cape Canaveral are that land that's owned by the city at Cheerdown Park and potentially somebody could develop something down there on Center Street. <clears throat> the IAP properties for sale too. The IAP property is for sale. That's a great opportunity. And the uh, city does not own Cherry Don Park. Uh, it, yes, I know. I looked that up. It is owned by Brevard County, but there's several commissioners that have voiced a strong desire to uh, divest themselves of city parks. Yeah, and so that's simply a, a lobbying effort, especially to buy will carry that torch for you. I, I believe that um, our council has us uh, negotiating that currently. Um, yep. Our council felt like there were a lot of strings to the deal um, that did not need to be there. Um, and we've communicated that to the staff and 
actually just recently we've had some other ideas and thoughts that we might go forward that I haven't been able to express to my council yet, but trying to get, um, trying to get there yeah. in the way the council wants to get there. We would like to ultimately, I'll just share this, we would like to ultimately own the whole park. Yeah, feasible. well, I mean, it, like those parks that were divested down in Palm Bay, it was like two commission meetings. It was one and done. And they divested themselves of a number of parks. Yeah. Well, this, um, because, you know, some of the commissioners just don't want the financial burden. This, this proposal that we have from the county, it's got a number of significant clawbacks and non-ownership. So uh, that's a that's a political that's a, that's a job for the mayor to go and talk to the chairman of the board I'll of county commissioners. I'll be talking to the mayor very soon about this. We yeah. didn't have time today. We had lots of other things to discuss today. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's I mean it's not difficult to do. You just need to count to three. Yeah. Uh, and they did it in Palm Bay. Couldn't get it done in Laurie Wilson Park because of that you know park designation of that hammock which is a Brazilian pepper infestation, but it's a bird sanctuary. And the fact that they don't want to be able to charge for parking. But if you do have it as a private park, and I know at one time the city bought a bunch of meters that they didn't install, you could charge for parking, which is an amenity that most people are willing to pay for. Is that addressed in the economic development action plan? I don't recall. Uh, no, not charging for parking. It just is a logical thing to do. Well, if the board wants to discuss that and make a finding, and that, that's part of the board's purview is to make yeah. recommendations to city council. Anyway, I feel like I'm using too much of my time. I'm going to keep going. Uh, so, you know, usually when you have action plans like this, and I have the good fortune or not to have sat on a number of boards, uh, it's always nice to have that, you know, the action plans written down in a matrix. So not for this one, it's 13 years old, but... I think a lot of it's still relevant, but assuming this board tweaks this plan and comes up with a new one, then we should put that matrix together and use the green, yellow, and orange designations as to progress. Uh, the matrix saying it's timeline or yeah, priority? well, you've seen it all. You know, just keep staff honest. You know, mm -hmm. when you you have you put your action plans and simple bullet points and. Then you color code them, and uh, and then from you know quarter to quarter or year to year, uh, staff will then report back on the action items that they actually uh, had action on, and the ones that they didn't, and that uh, creates a it creates an, a subject for discussion, and then you can prioritize those action items uh, in order to track what's been done. Reading through it, I mean, this is kind of basis of my questions. Is like some of these things I know that you've done and I've been successful. Uh, the other ones that I asked about, I was curious. Have those been done? I wasn't aware of it. Uh, and and so you know, and then, so that's it. Knowing what you have, if you want redevelopment, and you want additional development, then you create incentives as a city. City owns very little land, so you incent with grants, impact fee abatements, ad valorem abatements, and the most important is allowances under the code. You know, those are the tools that the city has. And so you engender, you engendered hotel development by increasing the height from 45 to 65 feet and reducing the land requirements. You know, you see the results. You can engender mixed use in the same way by reducing the the uh, requirements for you know installing mixed use. Downtown city of Cocoa Beach has Cottage Row. You know it's like 400 square foot cinder block buildings because of setbacks and parking and density because they're 0.1 acres and they round down for density. They can't put a, a single living unit on top of a 400 square foot block home even if they bulldozed it. You know, so you lock yourself in based on your code requirements. If they just went into their comprehensive plan and land use development and said, we're gonna take a 0.1 acre lot and round up, you can have two units on this lot, then, you know, some of those little cottages would get knocked down. And uh, you saw the Cabron or whoever, you know, and the, the photographer, Ray Baldino, you know, he built a unit up top, just north of uh, Minuteman, southbound A1A. You know, you saw some redevelopment, just tweaks in the code. 
you know, took old buildings and put a unit up top, put new cladding on it, it looks great. Uh, there were some other ones there, uh, you know, uh, Jenny and, uh, and uh, uh, Juice and Java, you know, they had a development plan for a long time there, but that's an example of you can give them the tools, but the private property owners are still gonna have to execute on the plan. Uh, and then I took some time to look through the development opportunities that are in the city that are of significance beyond small parcels. And I came up with nine. You've got Mason BRB at the north end of the city, which is 20 acres, which is the biggest undeveloped parcel within the city, uh, which has a mix of zonings. Uh, we have Long Point Park, not recommending it be developed for commercial uses, but it's a great opportunity for the city under the uh, creating, uh, you know, livable, more attractive city, uh, uh, you know, park development, potentially with some amenities as well, which makes parks more attractive. <clears throat> uh, you've got LV Cape Canaveral, which is Ringdahl on the west central uh, west of A1A. You know, we, we all know, or at least you didn't know the history of the Ringdahl property, but that's an opportunity. And then you've got Tizel's on the south side of west central. He's got eight and a half acres, Discovery Bay, which is Tizel, which is on the south side of Thurm. It's very wet, that was a good opportunity. You got the IBM building, you know, right at your intersection, which unfortunately is not gonna be a traffic circle. I had to throw that in there, sorry. Uh, then you've got the IAP property, and you know, then you've got Center Street, which is a lot harder to do because you have so many property owners. But those first eight, you know, those are those are developable uh, parcels that could get marketed. You know, all property owners that are willing to sell, hopefully, at, you know, market rates. Uh, and if you want, like, you know, this speaks to businesses and employment, and you know, IAPs shutting theirs down. People aren't building offices. Banks aren't lending on offices. You know, the city's never going to dictate, you know, what the highest and best use for a property is. It's going to be based on, you know, the opportunity that comes to the private land developer. Um, but if you give them the tools to be flexible, and we have a PUD ordinance, which is great. You can go outside the normal zoning requirements uh, and present a project to the city. You're now con considering this mixed-use development, which is great. It's a little overly restrictive, you know, pass it. I don't think you're gonna see much. You know, you're gonna end up, I project, I predict, you're gonna end up tweaking it in order to see some results, but you know, at least the city's moving in the right direction. Um, sorry, I've taken my time. I yield, I yield the balance of my time. I think there's also one you missed, that's the uh, Betty Gold property at the northwest corner of Central and uh, North Atlantic. That's been for sale some 10 acres for years now. It's been for sale for Northwest like corner, yeah. of North Atlantic and West Central. Yeah. Yeah, it's the... North North of, isn't there a Circle K there? North. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's the mobile, it's the um, RV. Yeah, no, I, I've got it on my list. I just skipped it. Discovery Bay. No, it's, it's called Oak Manor Mobile yes. Home Park, 7.7 7 yeah. acres. Yep. I got it on the list. Yeah, it's been for sale for quite a while. 14 years at least. Well, I, yeah. I, I think the important uh, language that Tom was mentioning was folks who are willing to sell their property at market rates. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. that's... We negotiated with Vincent Keenan and Flo Staten for like 12 years, and finally the market grew into her price and we bought it. <laughs> she didn't move her price for 12 years. Wow, well, yeah. she came down a little. That's all right. But, you know... Well, Tom, thank you for doing your homework. Oh, my pleasure. Um, that was a lot of information, and thank you. I think you brought up some really great points there. Chelsea, what do you have that you want to talk about in the economic development plan? I just generally had a couple questions for staff, uh, just generally because this spans so many years. Were there any projects... I guess I'll start. What projects failed in the plan that you would think you wouldn't want to include in a future revision? And what do you think might have failed that is worth revisiting, if anything? Because maybe the circumstances were that they couldn't pass at the time 10 years ago or something like that, that I, I might be more viable now. I'll, I'll go first, Dave. If sure. You I, I think one of our biggest failures to date 
is our inability to establish a downtown. Um, that was imagined at this time. It was also specifically put into our economic overlay. Um, and for various reasons, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't happened. Um, I'm hopeful that perhaps the mixed use might bring some attention to that. There are certainly properties that are available in that area. But as you heard earlier, the, it requires the private property developers to be incentivized to do it. Um, and uh, this is one of the things I know the council is going to rec wrestle with um, again this next Tuesday night on the mixed uses is, is the, the concept of density increases. It's like a, a two-edged sword because on one hand you've got the desire to have an enticement and that's what developers want is density. On the other hand, you've got a, a small town feel that is just cherished by the residents here that they don't want to give it up. And higher density could potentially threaten that feel, that small town feel. And I, I get both sides of that argument, and, and I know the council does too. So I think part of that has been a, a reluctancy to approve higher density projects. Um, maybe that's part of why, because uh, Dave, you and I have definitely fended off um, requests from people who wanted to develop in that area, but they wanted 20 and 30 units, and we had to turn them away because our code didn't allow it. Yeah, at a, at, yeah, at a minimum, we've had we've had folks come in from. It's interesting. A lot of the developers that come in are coming in from the Orlando, Tampa, Miami areas, some of the bigger urban areas that allow 75, 100 units a, a, an acre, and so we've had some folks who've come in with with those stars in their eyes and we've really had to tamp it down what, um, what's allowed now no, 15 15 so can can i yeah. mention i think if i if in, in response to that question i think i'm gonna and i'm gonna echo what tom said is the flexibility right now our code is fairly inflexible um regarding certain things. And so I think the mixed use project, the mixed use ordinance is, is a, a great first step in that direction. Um, but it's uh, our, our zoning ordinance has it's been around since the, and it's pretty much its current form for probably 40 years. Oh. And so a lot of things have changed since then in the development business and the development process and, and, and our, our code is not really kept pace, and so I, I think we still have a lot to do. As Tom said, we've got financial incentives and we've got regulatory incentives as a city. Um, I, I think our financial incentives may be, we may be getting in a better place with those, largely due to our CRA, our Community Redevelopment Area, um, because those funds are really starting to generate and really starting to flow, and it's only going to get better and better. But our, our regulatory side is we, we still have, in my opinion, we still have some work we need to do to density is a, is a great example. Uh, mixed use, is, there's, just, there's just some things that we need to, so, so flexibility is, would be so, my so answer. I, I think that's one, of, like to recap, that's one of our failures is we've, we failed to de develop a downtown. Um, we've, as Tom mentioned, we've got some fairly rigid codes. Um, I also want to mention that you asked, or you were going to ask about successes, am I correct? <laughs> what we got right? Um, what we got right out of it was we did um, get some additional economic growth, and largely because of our CRA, no doubt about it. In the, in the overlay district. In the overlay district. That's been a success. Thing. But both of those, and they, they largely cover the same area. Yeah. And we have historically used our CRA dollars for infrastructural improvements, until this last go around of these grants, it had only been for, um, you know, city projects. Um, that, and that's, that's really enabled a lot of things. And I could go down that list. But also the economic development overlay has created, as Tom said, the more ad valorem tax revenue for the city. And largely because of the hotels. He, he's, he's right about that. Um, we've, we, we have every reason to believe that hotel growth would, will continue here until it reaches a saturation point. Just because we've got the port here, we've got an expanding number of cruise passengers, um, record years, even during COVID, it was better than they expected. So that's gonna to continue to drive that market. And, and I know how these, these uh, developers think, as long as there's capacity in that market, and we're, we have a highest rev par and uh, revenue per available room and rates uh, of 
maybe with the exception of Melbourne Beach, um, of the whole county. That's going to continue to drive that demand for hotels. And, and, we, and we really haven't even felt the impact of the, of the aquarium yet. Right. I mean, you've got 500,000 visitors a year coming in. What's, what's that going to do? And the overlay helped sp spur that along by having the uh, option to, or the ability to go to heights above 45 feet. And all the hotels that have been built since that overlay have been up to 65 feet. Um, also, Tom mentioned that they, we did away with the minimum five-acre requirement for hotels as a result of the economic uh, overlay. That made more land available for those hotels to develop. So from an economic perspective, I think that that was something that we got right as intended by the overlay district. Are there any industries or areas, I mean, you talk about the hotel growth in a future plan uh, with revising this. Is there anything that the city hasn't targeted that you think is worth targeting in a future revision of the plan? I remember at the time we were really trying to target the high-tech small footprint corporate headquarters, get your Cape Canaveral on your letterhead because it's known throughout the world mm -hmm. as uh, tech leading minds and the brightest minds of capable. Um, we didn't get a whole lot of that. We, we do have a SpaceX presence here for corporate headquarters, not, not corporate headquarters, but the tech sector mm -hmm. is there. Yeah. Um, we did get um, comprehensive health was here um, as a corporate headquarters. That that was nice to have that. Of course, that's changed hands a couple times now. Uh, that, that was a win. But marketing ourselves as that um, has, we, we haven't spent a lot of money on that, actually. We just, we talk about it. We, when we're dealing with site selectors, we share that information. But um, we haven't seen a whole lot of small footprint, high tech corporate headquarters. I would say, Dave. I, yeah, agree I, with that. I, I agree, and I, I think to a large degree, because who we are and where we are and what we look like, as far as you know, our our, our size and, and the 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 makeup of the the residents and the in the built environment, if you will. I. I think we need to take a real hard look at how much we can really influence the market and what the market wants to bring to Cape Canaveral and the trajectory the city has been on since the 1960s. I think we can tweak it and we can nudge it, um, but to a large degree, please jump, anybody jump in if they disagree, our, our die is cast to a point. Um, we've got these major influences just outside of our city. And um, we've got so little vacant land left to develop. When you start factoring all those things in, you know, they're, 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 it's kind of like when you take your kids bowling and they put the guards up on the sides. <laughs> you got some room to work in there. Um, but, uh, but there's, there's, you know, it's, it's not like we're uh, a, a completely new uh, city with all this vacant land and all, this high, all these roads and infrastructure. Um, our roads are set. Our infrastructure is set. We've, our, 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 you know, a lot of stuff is set and established. But I'm not saying we can't tweak it because we can. But um, I, I think it's a different, little different animal. I agree with all that. But we're also open to it creative ideas. Oh, We've yeah, got a course. few community surveys that our residents really want certain things. They'd love to have more restaurant dining options. They'd love to have a drugstore. They'd love to have more grocery options. Things that serve the residents. They, year after year we hear this. And the problem, and I know many of you have heard me say this before, is the, the methodology that site selectors use, which is the radial ring methodology, because we're a narrow barrier island, you get the ocean and the river, and those aren't households that spend money. And if you're looking at a Trader Joe's or an Aldi or anybody who's doing a site selector and they're looking around, they're not gonna look at Cape Canaveral. That five mile radial ring is yielding so little, and they've got 30 other project sites in the southeast that they're ranked so much higher than us because of that. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't get the second glances. Uh, the other thing is there, there's another methodology that some have used, not everybody does, and that's the, the drive, tried and trade analysis where you're looking at how many 
businesses or residents are accessing this roadway mm -hmm. in this stretch, in our case, it's A1A. And what are, the, what are the demographics of those people? So you're not doing the radial thing, you're doing the linear thing. And that is a harder thing for site selectors to do. They're, they're, they're trained to do a certain way. And especially if, if they're getting fat off all the other options out there, why are they gonna look at right. this other option? It takes a more forward thinking site selector to get there. So if we're not gonna get it by doing what we've always done, we gotta change what we've been doing. And, and that could be potentially targeted selections with um, incentivizing, combined with. And incentivizing can take several forms. Obviously, there's the CRA, there's cash. That, that's not an easy sell, but sometimes it can be done. There, the CRA, we, our CRA board has talked about aggregating sites that we buy with the CRA dollars that are underutilized properties and raising them and joining those properties together and making them an opportunity site of five or 10 acres. And then, you know, if you had that, market it, you could at least get what you put, it out, put into it out of it as your minimum sales price, but you're potentially getting rid of blight, attracting new development, but you could make it specifically for what you want it to be. Maybe that's that Trader Joe's, maybe that's that Aldi, and you, you put an incentive package together towards that. Um, it, it requires, that kind of thing requires the city to step way out front and act forwardly and deliberately and then be hopeful. And because that represents the expenditure of time and money, it's hard for our residents to get behind us spending time and money that way, betting on the come of that. Has so, that been the barrier in the past as residents? Um, well, if it, residents want more groceries and restaurants and stuff it's, like it's, that? I mean. the, the whole process in, in Cape Canaveral, just like in Cocoa Beach, that we, we've got an elected body that's elected by the residents, the people that live here that need to represent the, res, the residents' interests if they wanna stay in office the next time come around. And they listen to these residents and that has a very powerful influence on any elected official. Um, and, and I've seen councils go further away from that and I've seen you know this council come much closer to that. Over the years, there's a pendulum swing of you know, independent, I'm gonna just do what I think is best for the business owners, I don't care about the residents, this makes business, to I'm sensitive to the residents' needs, I want to give the residents what they want. And um, we're, we're definitely closer to that ladder right now, the, in the, the pendulum swing. Every one of our council members cares deeply about the residents' needs. Yes, sir. <clears throat> How to phrase this? Uh, so much of it is in the messaging because the irony in the statements many times are confounding. I want lower taxes, but I want no development. You know? Mm -hmm. Those are diametrically opposed. If you have no development or redevelopment, you necessarily will have higher taxes because costs only go up. And so it's an educational process. Yes. I want services. I want an Aldi. Nobody will build an Aldi here. I bet you you could get an Aldi if you put the right incentive package together without buying land and spending tax dollars. And it's, as David pointed out, it's density and it's flexibility under the code. You know, if you make it attractive enough and you can put requirements to it, See Coco, I just got their email again today. They've had that old city hall site across from Murdoch's that they've been trying to give away now for a decade. They need a parking garage. They own it, you know, and I've been in the meetings and I looked at it and they want a hotel. We're going to give you the site. We just need a hundred, you know, structured parking spaces in return at 20,000 a piece is $2 million for the land, you know, so even in that scenario, and they're, they're letting, you know, they'll let you go 80 feet, they'll let you go mixed use and everything else. It's very hard to do, and that's, you know, that's kind of the location, you know, it's tucked away in the back of Cocoa Village, and hotel guys don't necessarily see the demand drivers uh, all of the port. Uh, and so, you know, they just had one application this last week, and their CRA board turned it down, and they're going back to the drawing board. But if you allow, 80 feet and mixed use development with hotel and apartments and everything else and say, 
I want a grocery store. I want some medical offices or offices. I want some doctor's offices in here. Somebody will buy the land and build you that. But it has to, it has to be, it has to be, you know, you have to be able to make a profit. Land in Cape Canaveral right now is selling at a million an acre. And at a million an acre, you're never gonna get an apartment building at 15 units an acre. It just, it doesn't pan out. I mean, it, you go into the red before you even get to like operating costs. And I think those things inform that pendulum swing. Yeah. And so the messaging from the board is like, okay, city, yeah, you want it walkable. Yeah, you don't want any more people over here. Can't do anything about the port. Can't do anything much about the traffic. I've said this in Cocoa Beach for 20 years. What we do here in this city impacts traffic on an infinitesimally small basis. A 200 unit apartment complex on West Central at Oak Manor or Tizel's property isn't gonna move the needle one bit on traffic. This traffic is dictated by everything from Melbourne Beach all the way through Patrick, everything that's happening at the port and everything that's happening in East Orlando. And so that's gonna increase by you know, by things that City of Cape Canaveral has no control over. And so if you kind of educate people to this and use traffic engineering studies and say a 200 unit apartment building mixed use on West Central or on North Atlantic, uh, and you show them the trip counts relative to the trip counts that are going up and down the street, even if every citizen of Cape Canaveral sold their cars, you probably wouldn't notice a difference of the traffic on the street. And so, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going on. Uh, well, you're, it's an educational process. If you want X, then you'll incentive on private land by making it financially feasible and attractive for developers to bring it. Yeah, and you've got your finger right on the pulse of this exercise. An economic development action plan, a, a read designing a retooling of that plan needs to include this board's best thoughts on that as a recommendation to city council. Um, I think the whole creative exercise of how we might actively pursue those amenities that our residents say we want, and that's quality economic development for a grocery store or more dining or whatever, put that into the plan about, you know, as a goal, this is what we want to do. That's an idea for an update to this plan. Actively target them with incentives and, and codes that incentivize. So I think those are all great thoughts and I, I know that we're going all over the place, Chelsea, on your question, okay. but we're-, oh. we're We knew this was gonna be a discussion, yeah. which, I just, Oh, that's pretty much it for my questions right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Did you have anything else you wanted to I add? Not. Um, Tom hit pretty much 98% of what I had noted. Um, the only other thing that I noticed that um, Tom hadn't already covered um, had to do with, where is it? The support of existing businesses um, with, that's action number, item number four. Um, which is about helping current businesses understand what's available from the city, meaning the small businesses understanding what's how they can fast track their permitting, their planning. Um, and that I think is something that we can do a better job at. Um, as a city, I think there can be a, a speed up of permitting for, for renovation projects versus it takes the same amount of time to get something through permitting, unless you're doing a brand new development, to renovate a small renovation as it does to build a whole new house. So where can we streamline that and make it for blight where we can make it faster? Um, is something, if you're looking for updating facades and things like that, if you've got to wait forever on permitting and it takes more time, then you're going to lose the momentum. And if it's difficult, I'm not going to do it. Um, so that was my, my, the only thing that Tom hadn't already brought up, um, that was on my list. So I think we've got a lot of things in here that we want to rework in an economic development plan. Obviously we've got a lot of points. I still would love a report from staff on the, 
the wins and losses. Kind of a, these are the action points that we know we accomplished already and the ones that we believe need to be revisited. So like you did the full website and taglines and things like that from staff's perspective, is it done or does it need to be redone? And some of that's our perspective also. And that goes back to what Stu was saying about some market research and understanding where we sit. I'd also like feedback from staff as to what areas do you all think need to be addressed from your perspective as well as our perspectives? Because you guys live in this plan in a way that we don't. So um, I know you're writing, Kyle, and I know this is being written down, but I think we're sum to summarize, um, we want to return with a, um, a staff product which shows <coughs> what we think we've got right and what we think, where we think we failed economically. Um, and I think that's, well, that's essentially it, Dave. Did you and hear? what you think needs to go back and be done again, meaning like you may have done it successfully 10 years ago, oh, okay. but it's now outdated. Are, are you suggesting, I mean, we've got a number of goals in this document right here. Your top ones. It doesn't have to be every single one, but okay. your top ones. What but do you think? That would be a good starting point to yeah. go through here and mm -hmm. identify our top ones and then yeah. see if we've, maybe we have a list of wins from here and we have a list of Need to work on. <laughs> Need, needs improvement. Needs improvement. Yeah. That would be really helpful from yeah. y'all's perspective. Yeah. Um, and then I think the next question that we have to decide and understand is, do we have funding to ask for another study to be done, to ask for a market research study to be done? Do we have fund? How do we, what is the mechanism for that? The, you know, this plan we're looking at was done by a consultant was developed, I'm sure there was funds and things attached. How does that process work for us now? So CRA funding would be an eligible expenditure if council, if the CRA board approved it, provided it only benefits the CRA district, or is intended to benefit the CRA district, and the study is limited to the CRA district. Uh, that That's the first easy one I can think of. Obviously, we'd have to otherwise budget. Yeah, it would have to come out of a general Probably, fund. if it didn't come out of the CRA, it would be a general fund expenditure. Right. Which, which is currently... Go for council and which would be part of the, as Todd's saying, part of the budget process, which we're just now starting to gear up for. So this is the time to have that conversation. It is. It's prime time for that. So uh, we would need to understand what an appropriate budget request would be so let's, Dave, let's get information, the cost information on um, such a study today, similar to the scope of the last one. And bring that back. Our council's first look at the budgeting process will actually be the um, CIP workshop that's scheduled for the last week of March. So if this board's meeting before then, we should have, be able to put that possibly into it. I think we're, meet, we're meeting in March. I last, the last meeting threw me. I think, I think it is March. Yeah. And that, that, that's the. No, beginning. we're meeting in April. So it was the first week of the. Is January. Of the, yeah. So January, February, March, April. April. We're meeting the first week of April. So I, I don't know that that it would actually be a CIP, but that would be a great time to introduce it at that March council meeting for that's that's really the kickoff of the budget season. That would refer us to meet again before our next meeting, which would I would have to put that before the group, if that's something. Because Tom and Chelsea, I believe, yeah, you guys were we last meeting decided that we would have a standing meeting quarterly, the first meet the first um, each first, first we anyway if we'd have a quarterly meeting if we chose to have meetings that were outside that we would just as a group agree to that and set a date. So what is the thoughts of the group on that issue well, to discuss, to get staff to get let, back let, to let us? Let me clarify. If, if you don't get the answer, if you don't get the information from staff prior to the CIP workshop, it doesn't mean it can't come to the city council at a future date in the budget making process. Matter of fact, um, I know we've got two council members here now and they can certainly receive the minutes from this, the whole council that there's a, the board has a desire for this. So what I, all I care about is that council doesn't get surprised by this request at the last minute. That's, that's never good look on a city manager. 
So as, as long as we get it in time, I would say maybe after the next regular meeting should be fine to get okay. that information right. to council. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we weren't gonna yeah. miss the bus for an entire year yeah. if we did not. Always a reasonable this question. This discussion will be helpful. Yeah. Okay. It'll be on, it'll be on the council's So do we radar. need a motion to direct staff or can we just? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah that's fine. Um, we have consensus of the board to direct staff to uh, obtain another market analysis. Uh, pr quote, price quote? Yeah, cost yeah. of. Okay. And also, we is there consensus for at the April meeting for us to come back and basically have a report for the board on the the highs and lows of the of the uh, accomplishments, what we did and what we didn't do. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah, that would be really helpful because okay. then from there, I think we're probably as a board going to start talking about redoing this plan and yeah. this and that and the steps that we would need to do to develop a new plan to come forward. Sure. And it's also worth reminding the board that you have the luxury of serving in two capacities, the general fund expenditure capacity and the CRA fund capacity, because the council wanted this board to make recommendations on CRA expenditures and policies. So you've got access to recommendations on both sides of that fence. I think this plan though, although a lot of the things in this plan and a lot of like the properties that Tom was talking about are outside the CRA. Yep. So the conversation needs to include the city as a whole, I think, if you're really trying oh, yeah. to move forward economic development and not just the CRA. We can do, I think there's the opportunity to utilize CRA when it's in the CRA, but we need to look at the whole city if we're going to. And we could fashion an argument that since the CRA covers 56% of the city, it could cover 56% of the cost. Anybody have any? Thing they want to add to that? Thoughts? Uh, um, probably premature, but you know we want to discuss and get input from the commission on the scope if we're going to redo a plan like this. I wasn't thinking. I mean, I'm glad to hear you're considering it because the thinking's probably changed and everything else. All of the visioning process that happened that I thought was very successful, 2009. We redid it again in 2021. Yeah. Uh, Might be helpful to see that if it was redone in 21. Oh, you need the report. You don't have that report. We don't have the uh, 21 report. Probably, Dave, let's get them that report. Probably see that report. The one in 09 was great. A lot of good things came out of that. The the new one, you'll you'll see that pendulum swing effect of it. it it's, it's definitely gone from that era of 09 of let's make a lot of change happen in the city back to let's preserve what we've currently got and slow down and take a breath. Because 21 for a study is, also, is would be helpful to review that study also. I mean that visioning process, sorry. The 20, 21 one? Yeah, Dave's writing it feverishly. <laughs> yep. All right, so we have some more homework to do. Was it well attended in 21? Well, we were, we were coming off of COVID. Um, it's actually started in COVID, and there weren't a lot of live meetings for it. It was, for a matter of fact, the first one or two, I think, Mickey, they were, they were virtual. Yeah, and, and some people even wearing masks on the virtual. <laughs> and then you get back into when we finally had the last one or two that were live, I remember we were spread out in this room or somewhere, everybody's really spread out, you know, still COVID wary. And the attendance wasn't as great as we had hoped, but I think the sentiment came through in the report. We got enough, and it was professionally hosted. Uh, Doug Thomas did that for us, did a good job. I, I think you'll find value in it, even though we didn't get overwhelming numbers of people involved. The other thing that I think would be helpful, and I know that Tom and I are both aware and following and understanding the processes that are happening with it, with the DOT improvements that are happening with A1A. I, for the other members of this group to understand that, when we talk about what's happening from an economic development, what's gonna be happening with that road and an update on that and an awareness for everybody. I wanna make sure we're all working from the same level of knowledge when we're discussing improvements for landscaping on A1A, but there's DOT work that's coming. 
and what does that look like? And I think that's really, and where those turn lanes are going and how that's gonna impact traffic flows and, and all of that I think is just a, a brief update on that would be helpful so that everybody's on the same page as to the status of that. Yeah, I think we can get Lexi here possibly to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I, yeah. Because I know we'll Tom and I it. follow it pretty regularly, but I'm not sure where everybody else is. Right. Oh, their, uh, their plans and their updates are pretty accessible right on the website. Yeah. So yeah. just some... Plus the city is something that hasn't been published. So yeah, just so that we make sure everybody's got the same information on that would we'll, be great. We'll, we'll provide a, a summary of where we are. And then the but links. Tom's right. Yeah, and, and put the, the links, links are... in the summary. Yeah. So if we want to dig in and play with all the roads, it could be fun. I ha I'm sorry, but I have to leave. Well, and I think we're almost done the... Um, Anything else on this issue, on this discussion, guys? I think we've got some great places to work from here. Um, I also wanted to update um, in the um, in our last meeting in uh, just a little bit of old business, unless anybody has anything else. We talked about um, an aquarium update and a request from this board to do that. Um, I did reach out to um, the um, aquarium team and got their community engagement person in contact with Dave, and they are working to have a presentation that we'll all be invited to and city council. So I think maybe during a city council meeting, the details are still being finalized out so that anyone within the city council or this group or other boards that are part of the city can get an update of where they are, what's happening, and all of that, because there's quite a bit of movement that's been happening in that, and that was something this group had asked for. Yep. Um, so that is in, in the works. In the works. Also, I'd like to mention that at one of the last meeting, the couple of meetings, the, the board indicated an interest in attending ribbon cuttings and ground breakings and things like that. Well, we do become aware of those things, um, both in the city and countywide. Just wondering if that is something the board would like to be made aware of are the county-wide um, events or just just focus in on stuff going on in the city. It's no problem to just to forward you, forward you all the stuff that we come across and you can kind of decide whether you want to attend it or not, both in or outside the city, but. I thought I need one more email, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll just continue then, I think, what I'm hearing. We'll just continue to forward all, and, and, and the board can kind of make an individual decision on whether you go or not. All right. Any other matters to bring before the group? Not for me. Anything else we need to do, Dave? I think that is it, Madam Chairman. Um, am I forgetting anything? Anything, Renee, anything you can think of that we need to... We'll, we'll do, uh, is regarding the attendance, I know it's, a, it's frustrating for both the board and, and for staff, frankly. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to do a better job of getting word out to the board. Um, I guess that means we'll have to send out a few more email reminders or something. Um, but um, could, could we just establish the nominal dates for the whole year? You get that on people's calendars? Well, we did establish that at the last. So it's the yeah, first. It's, it's always going to be the first Thursday of the quarter? That was the. Yes. The okay. second yep. Thursday, second Thursday. Second Thursday of the first month of each quarter. Of each quarter. Yeah. I don't know what day it is. It's can, you send, can we send out like a calendar and um, invite already for those dates? Like yeah. so, that it, so that it's already on the calendar. So if we send the calendar invite now for all. Like I have dates all the way to the end of the year. Um. That would be really helpful. We'll do that. We'll have it out in the next day or two. Good idea. That would, you know, at least give us the opportunity to say, oh, I put it on my calendar. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it, I mean for me, it helps just know. Oh, yeah, like, to know it's already there. It's yeah. there, so when I have travel plans or whatever. And look at it. Yeah. All right, if there's nothing else decision. for today, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.